counting the sorry i missed it okay let's do it again counting the cost of taking leaps okay awesome so carla um so what was the very first job that you've ever taken in your life my very first like my very first full-time job yeah any part-time job yeah. Or, yeah well i mean very first part-time job would have been um uh when i was in college my first year of college i started when i was maybe like 16 in the states and i took a job as a um, my mom told me to do jobs so i took a job as a um sales associate at a uh department <laughs> store so what did you what did you do? I worked in the linens department with like towels and sheets and and um you know um yeah napkins and things and um I basically helped to sell towels, sheets, um napkins, those kind of stuff. And uh yeah, that's what I did. I helped sell, I helped clean the department, fold, um, comforters, you know, blankets, all that kind of stuff. Oh, so did you hover people over or did you talk to people? Did you get out of your way? Did you knock on doors? So what did it entail? Well, basically, so you're working in a department store. So you stand behind the counter. People come with things they want to buy. You check them out. You know, um, as people are walking around, you can go ask if they need help um, with selecting items or finding something. And then you clean up and, and refold things after people have looked at them and things like that. So just like working in a, a regular store. Oh, wow. So did you have to work at the time or what what uh, caused you to work there? I didn't have to work, but my mother wanted me to start working. So I started college and I started working at the same time so that I could, um, I guess, get used to the world because I hadn't worked up to that point in time. And so she wanted me to have the experience of working. And my first semester in college, my mom also had me taking like very a very light load. And so I was able to adjust to college life and working life at the same time. So that was the plan. Oh, your mom did a great job in navigating you through life and also in uh, how you can maintain a balance between schoolwork and actual job experiences. So how was your childhood? How did you, well, how was um, your life like before you took up the part-time job? Well, my mom's a very strategic person. And so um, uh, childhood was also quite um, strategically um, uh, worked out. And so um, I'm from Canada. I was born in Canada, but my parents, both of them are from Jamaica. And um, when I was a child, I lived between Canada and Jamaica. And my mom sent me to live with my dad's sisters. Um, they were... Um, they have an elementary school in, in Canada um, and a uh, private elementary school. And so I'm not sorry, in Jamaica. <laughs> and so I went and lived with them. And when I was, um, I went back and forth when I was like elementary school age. And, and then right around like late middle school, I was there um, all the way through from late middle school, all the way to the graduation from high school. I lived with them for about five years. And um yeah, with my aunts and uncles and cousins, and um, as a uh, only child before that, got used to the the excitement of being around lots of people. <laughs> you said what? What did you say? I was like an only child before, because my mom's the only child. Um, and so um, when I was with her, it was just me. But when I went to live with my aunts and my uncles, and it was them and my cousins, and just a lot of us <laughs> together, got to oh. experience both sides of life. Oh wow. So I do have siblings, but they're like half siblings from my, my dad's side. Okay. So you were in Jamaica when you were in elementary school and you were in the, in Canada when you were in middle school and high school? Oh, sorry. Flip. I was in Jamaica. Um, I was in Canada for most of elementary school, a little a back and forth between Jamaica and Canada. And then I did all of like from seventh to graduation, seventh grade to graduation, I was in Jamaica. Oh, I see. So, oh, cool. So how was your uh, school experience? Um, if you can uh, contra make, make some sort of contrast. I remember. Um, my memory's not good before I was 10 years old, let me think. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, in Canada, I think my mom said basically the Canadian education system was maybe easier than the Jamaican one. Um, uh, I enjoyed, you know, going ice skating with my my classmates and um, going strawberry picking with, you know, the brownies um, and so or Girl Scouts. So I liked um, those kinds of things. I remember at school, I think was fairly fun. Um, I was a very um, outgoing little girl. And so I had a great time. Um, in Jamaica, I went from elementary school was like co-ed, boys and girls. In Jamaica, I went to an all-girl Catholic school. Um, I was like a secondary school, which basically combines middle and high school together. And so it was a different experience um, with nuns and, and uniforms. And so, <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it different, yeah, different experience. So, yeah. So I heard that Jamaicans are pretty academically uh, inclined, like Koreans, mm -hmm. like Koreans are. Is that true? Yes. The system, the school system there is based on um, the British system and very, um, very intense, uh, lots of, yes, <laughs> tests and, and, and um, lots of studying. Um, and uh, yes. <laughs> Very intense. My mom wanted me to go to school there. Oh wow! What what what? Did she thought that it was it would help you more along the way academically. Right, we have better foundation for me um, going forward because the plan was to go to university in the states, and she thought it would have a better um, I'd have a better academic um, foundation. Wow, your mom is amazing. You your mom wanted the best at every stage of your life. So. You played in Canada. <laughs> you you prepare your college life in America in Jamaica, mm -hmm. and you went to America. So, how was American education system? Um, I mean, things with college is generally a lot freer than you know anything before that, and so you know taking classes at different times of the day, meeting new friends and people. Ah, uh, the biggest challenge for me was getting like culturally adapting because I didn't have any of the cultural background that my friends had, the movies, the songs, the all the, the different, you know, um, what do you call this, colloquialisms and, and slang. I didn't know any of that. Because um, in Jamaica, we didn't have the same um, basis for culture and, and movies and slang. I mean, everything came way later back then. Um, and so I didn't know any of that. So it was a, a bit of a learning curve to get the right words to express what I wanted to express. And um, yes, there were some interesting moments of me using words in the wrong context. <laughs> and so, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah. if, if you can um, bring your attention to uh, different things that you took from your, uh, your family, from Canada, from Jamaica, from America, what would it be like if that's, if there's one thing that really stands out to you that shaped uh, you into the person that you are today, what what kind of qualities do you think you cultivated from each cultural influence? That's a deep question. Um, well, um, I, I'm a little a little stumped there. Um, I guess for my mom, it's this, and even with her, you know, being a single mom in Canada, you know, she, my mom's very resilient. Um, she finds ways to get things done. And if it doesn't work one way, she'll find another way. And so she is, she's quite resilient and quite a strong person. Um, she, very little gets her down and she always worked like multiple jobs and so she was a uh like a quintessential um immigrant woman just really strong very resilient very focused um i i don't think i have anywhere near as much of those traits as she does um however there are things that um have shaped me in some ways and i guess have helped me to keep going in my life um, thus far. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, 
my aunts and my family in Jamaica, my dad's side, are very entrepreneurial. They're very into um, finding ways to have their own businesses and and um, do that well. And so, and they're very, very hardworking, very dedicated as well. And so um, I have a bit of that from them. I guess that, that probably helped me to, from the influence of my mom and from my aunts and uncles and, and, and such, helped me and my dad. Um, that kind of influence helped me to, uh, I think, persevere through getting three degrees and, um, you know, also helped me to, I guess, be more adventurous. Like there's got to be some way to live a life that um, resonates with who I am as a person and that um, is fulfilling. And so I think uh, the example of my, my aunts and uncles and my dad um, helped with that part of things. Um, that's Jamaica. In the U.S., uh, there's just so much that you experience in the U.S., so many different cultures and people. Um, I had never been around people from other Caribbean islands. And so, you know, being around people from various um, islands, various countries, uh, getting involved in exchange trips, and going to other countries and seeing people live there, all of that helped me to become even more of an internationally focused person um, and interested in just experiencing different places and different people. And so I think that's what the American part of my experience gave me. I see. Wow, that's pretty cool. So. You learn resilience from your mom and from your dad's side, uh, advent being adventurous from America, being diverse, being exposed to different international uh, exposures. Um, so uh, you said you got three degrees. So how did you decide what to study? Um, <laughs> well, um, my mother had a plan. <laughs> I was going to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> When I went into um, undergrad, she'd actually said to me to major in English. Um, and I was like, why would I major in English? If I don't go to law school, then what am I going to do with that? And so I majored in business, um, management and um, finance undergrad. And then um, since I did that, uh, when I applied to law school, I also applied for an MBA program and got into both at the same school. And so I ended up um, doing the MBA and the law degree. Um, I did maybe two years of law school, took a year off, did the MBA, and then went back to law school for the last year. And so that's how that happened. I ended up thinking I might get into international corporate law. So my MBA was like in global management. And in my law degree, I kind of focused on um, uh, international comparative law. And so the goal was to, you know, do something international with those degrees um, in the law and business um, arenas. And so that was yeah, how it kind of came together bit by bit. So you, why did your mom want you to be a lawyer? Um. Uh, well, you know, maybe similar to Koreans in Jamaica, you know, <laughs> big things are, you know, lawyer, doctor, you know, business person, accountant, these kind of things. And um, when I was a child, uh, I was very um, vocal, very um, talkative, uh, <laughs> very outgoing, and I read a lot. I loved reading. And so my mom, you know, and I wrote very well. And so she observed my, um, my uh, love of language and the love of communication and my... Uh, <laughs> strong kind of argumentative um when I was a kid I think she called that precocious but like always questioning well why or you know, what's going on here and very um yes involved and inquisitive and so she thought oh, with all these qualities you'd be a good lawyer wow that's that's amazing so your so how did you your mom cultivate love for books I, you know, I'm not even sure how she started that because both my parents were more in the mathematical side of things, which has never really been my thing. 
but I think as a child, I don't know when she was reading to me or something, she noticed I liked it, but she would just, remember when I was in Canada, she would just take me to the library and leave me there in the summer. And I would stay there all day and just read 20 books a summer. <gasps> I just enjoyed reading. It just wasn't my thing. And my sisters, I don't remember this, but they'll tell me that when I was in Jamaica and they'd visit and stuff, you couldn't talk to me. I'd be walking with a book all the time. Like you <gasps> couldn't get my head out of a book. Um, my my one of my eyes is actually not that wonderful because I would at night be reading and just it just was I don't know she introduced me to it somewhere along the line maybe in elementary and I just it just took wow so you were you were put in into that environment you weren't forced to read oh no I I think I think my mom did the, the general things you do at home you try to do with kids you know do their homework with them and stuff but I think she just noticed that I tended in that direction. And then she just fed it. Right? So, wow, that's amazing. Then why did you not become a lawyer? Um, when I was in remember when I started law school, the dean told us the first day that this is just the beginning. Like all y'all are stars from where you came from, but you see nothing yet. Like this is and and law school is nothing compared to what being a lawyer is gonna be like. You're working seventy hours a week, you don't have time to do anything. This is just the beginning. I was like, oh. <laughs> um yeah so the um, the idea of spending 70 hours a week doing something that I wasn't necessarily um all that interested in um I was good at going to school I, I'm a good uh I guess scholar but in terms of actually practicing law it wasn't very interesting to me um I did well in the classes uh however I wasn't I didn't feel like I had the kind of passion and drive to be able to do that 70 hours a week. And so I chose not to. I guess that lifestyle of being consumed with writing and reading and isn't that, isn't that what, what it is for the lawyers to, to do? Like you have to read a lot, you have to write a lot before you got up and talked at the court. Right. So there's a lot of research that goes in beforehand and putting things together and um, then delivering the arguments. And um, yes, I was I was OK with law school, but the actual practice of law, I didn't really see myself doing that. Wow. So so what did so you, you, you kind of encountered a roadblock in terms of finding your career path, though. So what did you turn to after that? After that. I wasn't sure right after I applied for an internship with like an NGO um, when I graduated from law school and I took the, the licensing exam in Florida. And then after I took the exam, um, I got some information back from the from even before from the NGO I'd applied to. And they said that um, they had declined to give me the internship. And one of their um, reasons was that I didn't speak. I only spoke one language. And so the idea came, well, maybe I should go somewhere and learn another language. I've been taking Spanish since middle school. However, I wasn't fluent in it. Um, and so I decided to go to Spain for a year to just for the purpose of learning Spanish. And so after I graduated, my father was happy with me. And so he ended up um, paying for me to be in Spain for a year. And I learned Spanish. And um, came back able to speak and while I was there I was just praying and asking God what do I do next because I don't know what to do after this um I wasn't sure then that I wouldn't have been in law I hadn't made that decision at that point in time but it was I wasn't I didn't know and um while I was there I found out about um, a missionary organization um Outpost Centers International and so um I ended up feeling called to go to uh, work at a mission outpost in the Dominican Republic. And so I ended up coming back to the States, telling my parents about this. They were not necessarily happy. Um, they were actually quite unhappy. And um, uh, it was a bit of a struggle. And I, wrote, I, I raised money and um, yeah, I went to the Dominican Republic like maybe a year, a little bit over a year after I graduated from law school. So what did you do there? 
I worked, I was a missionary. Well, I went to um, uh, medical missionary training school to learn how to help people heal diseases and prevent diseases through lifestyle um, lifestyle change. And um, I and having a more natural lifestyle, you know, walking in nature, getting sunshine, um, drinking more water, changing diet to a more plant-based diet, exercise, using things like hydrotherapy and massage. And so, um, I, and then also getting involved in agriculture, growing crops and these kinds of things. Uh, Cause we are out in the countryside um, in, in the Dominican Republic. And so I did that maybe like a year and uh, a half maybe. And uh, yes, that was the most um, adventurous thing to date because it was totally different than anything I've ever done. I'd never lived in the country. I'd never done anything with farming. I just, it was like a totally, yes, like 180 degree difference from my life before. I feel like also when I was doing mission work outside of mm. my comfort zone, knocking on doors, talking to strangers, doing strange things that I wouldn't have ever done, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do. Um, I think that was my the happiest moments of my life. I don't know how 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 was it for you? Well, Dehua, you are a, a one of a kind gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> because those were definitely not the happiest moments of my life in the beginning. I, I mean, I was all gung ho to go, went through all this to get there. And when I got there and the reality of, you know, um, washing clothes by hand and <laughs> you know, with tarantulas and snakes and, you know, um, <laughs> bathing in rivers. Yeah, I, it did. You know, and the agricultural work, like I, my body, I just was never, I went to the gym, the gym just for fun before. And so being there and having to, you know, do actual manual labor for at least half a day um, every day. Yeah. Four hours a day every day. That was, yeah. So I went through a really um, challenging patch where I was like, Lord, what were we thinking? I don't know if this is the right idea. <laughs> and so God and I had some very candid and, and um, yes, very candid and, and animated conversations about that whole situation <laughs> I, don't, I don't think i literally enjoyed every single minute of it because i hated every moment of it when i was knocking on doors because it was so embarrassing so humiliating so humbling but when i look mm -hmm. back uh it was pretty great because i was able to be delivered from myself in a sense because i was mm -hmm. looking to god looking to heaven looking to other people right. looking to neighborhood that i wouldn't help to so I think it was, I don't know, I think it was just so electrifying in that aspect, but I'm pretty sure you were very uncomfortable. I was very uncomfortable. So um, um, just looking back, is, yeah. yeah. Looking back, I mean, it was one of the, the life-changing moments in my life because I really saw myself being somebody I never thought I could have been. I just never, and nobody who knew me thought I could. So my mom was like, you're not like a, a manual labor country sort of person. Like, what are you thinking? And so, yeah, to see myself live that life, however imperfectly, by the grace of God, um, for the time that I was there, was really, it, it, yeah, it did, it did something for me to see that you know you could be different. You don't have to be how you've always been. Um, you know, God can help you to be different. And so, yeah. Oh. So after that, what did you do? After that, I came back to the states. I was lost again. I think I tried briefly to start my own legal practice, like, um, and then, but it didn't, didn't take. And so I ended up, um, my law school mentor actually, um, he helped me get a job, um, as a contract worker at a, um, at a college in my, my city. And so I worked with one of the vice presidents there, um, helping them with their, um, renewing their accreditation. And so I just helped gather paperwork and, and put things together for about four months. And then after that, I went to another um, uh, lifestyle educator training program at uh, UG Pines, which is a medical, it's like a, it's a lifestyle educator, lifestyle counselor, medical missionary training institution in um, the southern United States, in Alabama. And so I went there because I felt there were some gaps in my learning because I did all my learning in Spanish in the Dominican Republic. And so I wanted to kind of 
round out a bit. And so I went there and did their six month program to be a lifestyle educator and then work with a missionary, a mis- uh, ministry there for a bit. So I was an, a year there. So you were going back and forth between law, law and lifestyle uh, centers. So uh, what drew you to the health work? Um, when I was in law school, I went to, I was um, in a church that was full of young people. First time I'd ever been in a church that full of people my age. And we all started off not necessarily, most of us started off not necessarily the most committed to God. But over time, being in that church together, God just did something with us and we became very dedicated to living lives that were more consistent with the Bible and with um, the health message that our church um, promotes. And so I became, I just like midway through law school, I thought, okay, this is it. I am just going to change. And so I stopped, you know, all the secular music and all the various things that I've been doing before stopped. And, and one of the big changes I made was to become vegan just like cold turkey just threw everything out like i'm done I'm gonna be vegan. <laughs> and, <laughs> that's one of the few i think it's probably the only new year's resolution i've ever made that i stuck with and i think maybe i had meat one more time at a potluck after that but that was it and i well i had like um things that were other than fish because i started off at the, the lowest level i started off as vegetarian so i did like you know, like fish and eggs and, and milk and then little by little uh, maybe a year and a half later, I went straight vegan. And so, um, so yeah, because I became personally committed to living a healthier lifestyle, then I ended up um, becoming more interested in um, sharing that with others. So did you experience any uh, level of dramatic uh, health um, boost in your life? as a result of applying those lifestyle principles or was it has it been a gradual process? For the most part, it's been gradual. I think in the beginning, what maybe happened was because I was eating like on a regular schedule, I wasn't having snacks. My my whole um, gastrointestinal system, like my bowels moved regularly um, and moved well, which was different. Um, and when I ate temperately, I didn't have like heartburn like I used to have before. Um, I found eating more like I went through phases where I did different types of fasts and being on raw food really cleansed my body tremendously. Like my system was like clean as a whistle. It never moved that well ever. And so I, I experimented with different, um, different types of fasts and different, um, types of, um, food, uh, I guess combinations or food, uh, yeah, combinations, I guess, I ended up um, experiencing different um, benefits. Uh, I also, I, like I slept, you, I, I slept well, but not as much um, as when I overate or ate like um, heavier, like meat foods. And um, I think, as people tell me that I look younger than my age, I think a part of what has helped me to, well, my family has good genes as well, but a part of it has been just that, you know, um, I've been committed for maybe like 20 years or so to um, eating healthfully, trying to get some exercise in, <laughs> um, <laughs> depending on God, uh, and just having more, you know, sunshine and 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 uh, uh, fresh air and these kinds of things. Um, I'm not perfect at it, um, and there are parts of it that are easier than others. Uh, but nutritionally, I think I've been the most consistent with that, and I have seen um, good results in my skin and in how my um, my body eliminates and functions. Oh wow, that's fantastic! So after the that lifestyle center. What was next? After that lifestyle center, what did I do? I moved to Atlanta. And 
I worked as a weight loss counselor for one of the major weight loss companies back then. And I realized, oh, that's not going to work out for me because um, they focus on a lot of packaged foods and things. And um, after I left that job, I wasn't sure what to do next. And I was asking God, well, what do we do? I have no clue. And um, the word education came across my mind. And so I got my resume and I went and I gave it to different um, after school um, uh, learning centers. And one of them called me in for an interview and ended up hiring me. And that it was called C2 Educational Centers. And that one, it was run by Koreans, actually, a Korean couple. <laughs> and they had two branches. And um, this is in Atlanta, or outside Atlanta, Georgia. And I ended up working with them for a number of months and then easing into that was all the way through summer and then easing into the fall I started substitute teaching in um, middle schools and I, maybe a year later I got my first my, my my middle school job as a sixth grade English language arts teacher and how was middle school <laughs> well I did it for four years um full time and it was an experience um middle school taught me a lot about self control um i learned to speak more slowly because i found that if i said the same thing if i didn't speak slowly i'd be saying it four or five times and <laughs> i realized that i had a lot of um i was easily irritated and so, like, I'd find myself yelling at the kids and then apologizing and saying there's no need to yell and then yelling the next day. And so um, God helped me to develop strategies to deal with how I was feeling, you know, smile, breathe, pray, then respond. And so I, yeah, over the years, I got calm. Um, because I, I mean, from that first year, I mean, every little thing I was like, what? And yeah, so it really helped me with self-control and managing my irritation. <laughs> That's so funny. And then you, you went abroad or something, right? Um, no, after that, the next thing that happened was... I did most of my abroad trips when I was like in, 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 in college. I went to South Africa as an exchange student, Sweden as an exchange student, Japan as an exchange student. Um, and when I came back from Spain, I didn't go anywhere. Um, well, the Dominican Republic. After I came back from the Dominican Republic, I didn't go anywhere until I came here. Okay. So after that, after middle school, Korea. Yes. What happened? Why did you come to Korea? Interestingly enough, at that middle school, the largest minority were Koreans, lots of Korean students there. And so I got to know um, a, a Korean people. Um, I wasn't necessarily interested in Korea until I think maybe Thanksgiving 2011. I was watching, I was at home and I ended up staying at my place instead of visiting my mom that year. And um, I was bored and started trying to find something to watch. And I ended up discovering my first Korean drama. And uh, in the States, um, American TV shows can be very violent, very sexually oriented, and I didn't read, and languages can be interesting. I didn't want to um, take that in. And so that first drama was just like, what is this? Like he, it took 12 episodes before he even held her hand. This is amazing. <laughs> so I was hooked from the beginning um, because it was just so much um, cleaner. And um, then, and, and then the American shows. And so, yeah, I started watching those. And the more I watched, the more I was like, you know, Korea's not looking like too bad a place to go to. <laughs> um, maybe I could go visit maybe I could move there and because I was having challenges in middle school with the kids I was thinking you know maybe I could teach adults in Korea because I don't have the degrees to teach adults in the states um, and so yeah I uh, got more interested in it started looking into it and then applied for jobs wasn't able to get one and um, my dad was like 
what are you thinking of? Why are you thinking of going there? Don't think about doing that. Stay where you are. Be stable. And I'm like, you know, I want to actually do something that I enjoy doing. I want to be somewhere that I actually want to be. And so let's hope and pray this is it. Because if it's not, we're going to find someplace else. And he wasn't the most happy with that response. And um, however, he ended up being the one that paid for my ticket for me to come because I wasn't able to get a job. And I told him, I was like, Lord, how am I going to get a ticket? I don't, I don't know. And I prayed and asked God to guide me before I said no, before I left the job I had before. Um, and I was thinking, we're going to get the money for this ticket. And it was like, you know, ask your dad. I'm like, the dad who said two weeks ago that he doesn't know why I'm doing this and this is crazy. And so I called him and he was like, how much do you need? And I told him and he sent it and I was out the next week. I came here <laughs> the 19th, 2012. Yeah. And then... Was it a uh, language institute? When I first came here, um, I had met a Korean pastor by chance in um, the States, and he connected me with his brother here. And his brother and their, his family, they um, came and got me and took me to their um, country home. And um, they were the ones who got me connected with the language institute, SDA Language Institutes. And it was to them setting up an interview for me. I interviewed and I got my first job at SCA Language Institute. And I was there for maybe 10 months. And when that contract ended, I applied, I'd have been applying for university jobs. And then I got hired at a two year college. Um, and so, yeah. So, Language Institute, uh, the university for about 10 years, and uh, huh? another language in institute currently. Yes. And how has been the transition so far? Transition so far from... from so the first language institute and then the university and then the current one. Um, well, in the first language institute, I was um, teaching kids again, which wasn't the plan. And so I was like, oh, so it was a little bit bumpy in the beginning. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the adult students. And, um, and it was... Like teaching middle school, you teach the same thing like four times in a row because you're teaching sixth grade. And so it's a different situation than having multiple classes where you're teaching different things to different levels. And so that was some getting used to. And my schedule in the beginning was like an all-day schedule. Like I worked in the morning at like 7 a.m. I worked in the day. I worked at night at like 8. And so I was just like beyond tired. Um, however, you get used to it and the schedule got better. Um, at the same time, I was like, yeah, I wanted to get a university job and I really wanted to get one in the beginning, but it didn't work out. And I find that with me, usually there's generally a year of transition with anything I do. Like I moved to a new place, the first year, usually is a year of transition. And then I'm into whatever the thing is for that place. And so, yeah, when I got the college job, it was, it was just an answer to prayer, like. And they almost didn't even hire me because they had to figure out how to hire me with my experience background. And because I had teaching certification in the States, that's what made me eligible for that job um, in terms of the experience requirement. And so it just really was God working things together for me. Um, and teaching college was, was different. Um, I had never taught like for me, college students, for especially first year college students, are like big middle school kids. Um, same kind of <laughs> approach to life, just bigger people. Um, uh -huh. there, there, you don't have to deal with the parents. And so it's they're adults now. So it's just them. And so that makes it a little easier. Um, and the schedule is, is better. Um, they, you know, you're not teaching that many hours a day, and you can go home in between. and and so living and walking within walking distance of the place was very nice. And so, yeah, teaching wise, teaching has always been a challenging thing for me. Um, I, hmm, it's one thing to know a subject, it's another thing to actually pass that knowledge from yourself to somebody else. And while I've had teaching certification programs and things, um, I generally feel like I've done a TEFL course and things. I generally feel like, I'm not necessarily that good at teaching. 
Um, I'm much better at like, maybe facilitating learning than actually imparting instruction. And so, yeah, it's been it's been a, a challenging time. Some some semesters have been better than others. Some have been more inspired than others. And it's been just praying a lot that God help me because it's been it's been a challenge. So what what is your uh, approach in facilitating learning that you think you are better at than giving a lecture? I think it's more like inspiring students to discover what works for them. Well, first off, what do you want to learn? And then how what would work for you? And together crafting, okay, this is how we're going to do it. Um, and then evaluating from time to time, how is it going for you? What can we do to help it to be better for you? Um, what other ways do you want to experiment with? And so um, basically like um, brainstorming and engineering the learning process, evaluating it bit by bit as we go along, tweaking it to make it better. Um, and being there to, you know, answer any questions along with being the guide on the side. And this is what they taught us should be how we're doing teaching when I was in middle school. You're supposed to be the guide on the side, not the stage, sage on the stage. Um, however, the challenge, it's been tricky because how I've been taught to teach um, doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily a guide on the side approach. And so while I believe in facilitation of learning, I find that um, the imparting of knowledge part seems to come out more, and I don't do that very well, so <laughs> it's a little tricky. I see. <clears throat> so right now, you're also currently uh, teaching at a language institute. Uh, mm. uh, so how has it been uh, different in terms of teaching at a college and teaching at a language institute? Oh, totally. I way different um you know at at a college you know there's all the there are various projects and tests and assignments and keeping track of all those and you know working out the grades in a semester and and working with you know group dynamics and, and presentation skills and all these kind of things um and uh you know having the same uh batch of students Probably more often, maybe I used to see my students maybe four times a week because I worked in a, in a specialized program in culinary arts. And so I saw them maybe eight hours a week um, straight across and uh, focusing on test prep, presentation, um, preparation, and just regular English learning. And every semester I would have to figure out a new way to do it because um, I didn't really do my textbook for the most part. And so it was interesting. Um, and I also team taught. So like I would have them maybe a few, three days a week and another Korean teacher would have them one day a week, things like that. So I guess that was how that was with Institute Now. Um, I'm, it's very different in that I have a wider range of student ages. <laughs> and I have each class is different in its own way. Um, you know, my adult students have their way they, they do things. And I have one-on-one -on -one students and each one is doing something different, different test prep type things. And and, and, um, and then the kids, even within a class, they have different things they're doing. And so it's been a challenge for me to juggle the different things that people are doing in a class. Um, and keep everything flowing smoothly. Um, so yeah, it's been challenging. <laughs> so the the language institute that you worked for uh, ten years ago and the current system, how would you compare? Oh, very different. Um, the one ten years ago in a class, everybody's doing the same thing, and it was more of like you're imparting instruction. Like you're up here and you're talking, you're going around and checking to make sure that they're doing what you said they were going to be doing and so it was a very traditional teaching environment this one i think the institute i work at right now is more a facilitation environment and so it's closer to what i um i guess envision learning should be like or could be like to be more more effective or yeah 
And so, yeah, for that, it's good. And I also like how um, the last half hour we do some kind of um, uh, game learning activity, which I'm not necessarily the best with those because I haven't really done those a lot. <laughs> um, coming up with them is tricky. You're really good at that. I am just like, okay, what do we do now to make it different? And so, <laughs> yes, it does stretch the limits of my innovative <laughs> game ability. But uh, yes, I do like that aspect of it as well. So it is more of a facilitative environment. Um, for me, the biggest challenge is managing um, children. I'm not necessarily the firmest of people. I'm a lot gentler. And, and so that ends up causing challenges. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, when I first got the teaching started, when I was trying to be their friend and mm. friendly and all that and uh, I had a harder time so that's why I changed my approach and I said okay mm. this is the river you cannot cross <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> off limit <laughs> off limit um, space so I think it's working a lot better because of that mm. but I'm not trying to be mean but you know mm. they gotta do what they gotta do I gotta do what I gotta do so you know, I guess um, I've been learning a lot through trial and errors. Um, so how how is the health coaching uh, going? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I started out wanting to do both, you know, health coaching and teaching at this institute, um, plus a number of other things, YouTube channel, all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I realized that um, six months in that I've basically bitten off more than I could chew in one um, as far as I could tell. And it's um, the effort to maintain all these various things for six months has really drained me. And so I, um, I've kind of taken a step back from the health coaching for now to try to figure out how to regroup and go forward. Um, or yeah, from, from the, yeah, the wellness coaching. So I'm not really sure how I'm going to approach it. So right now it's kind of like, yeah, I would like to, you know, be able to find a way to incorporate, um, health coaching in the English language realm, maybe being out, it being a way to learn English while, um, participating in something that's, that's beneficial. And so I think that might be the easiest way to do it or the most practical way to do it, rather. Um, yeah. So right now I'm kind of trying to figure out how I could, I'm, I'm turning over my head. Yeah. How to do that. And just, yeah, taking a step back for a bit to, to regroup. That's true. I think every single student should have some sort of health issue. So um, if they can learn health benefits of applying health laws um if they can write write it out or articulate it um i think it would be a great service but definitely health is an area where everybody is, needs to work on because everybody is sick <laughs> mentally socially relationally emotionally so right. i think uh you're in the right track um mm -hmm. i think yeah i think I'm, I'm actually i feel very privileged to be able to work with you it's so inspiring to just talk to you every day and discuss things, uh, talking about students, talking about your life and my life. Uh, it's been very enriching for me to be able to resolve different issues and um, navigating through <laughs> our adventures. And I'm very grateful that you jumped on the boat and we've been <laughs> rowing the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you for saying that, Jay Walker. Sometimes I feel like I may be a liability, more of a liability than an asset. <laughs> <laughs> because yes, um, it's the first year of anything. I generally end up being very. Um, I find like looking back that I, I can get very tentative. Like, oh, was this the right idea? What was I thinking? And so I do find myself going through a bit of that. <laughs> um, and so yeah, that affects my my confidence and my momentum going forward. But I do pray that, yes, the Lord will stabilize me 
and yes um, actually, actually I'm, I'm learning so much from you because your your student retention rate is like so admirable um and your bonding with students is so exceptional that which i don't i don't think i have um and yeah i'm learning so much just the way you're carrying yourself and yeah like i don't think uh, i've ever heard students complaining about about you even once <laughs> the, they complain to me <laughs> i don't <laughs> want to do this um from i really um admire you and your willingness to jump in and your you're very stable in how you think about things very practical very logical very just centered and grounded and um very innovative as well and these are the things like i look at how your class just runs i'm like i want to go sit and observe his class again for a while i did this way back when in the beginning but i'm like let's go sit there again and pick up some pointers because your classes just run so smoothly and I feel like mine are a lot more um, <laughs> uh, freestyle-y and okay. haphazard. So it's it's quite, um, you're quite an inspiration to me, the way that, you know, you've jumped into this thing um, of having your own institute and you're sticking with it. You're, you know, um, even keel about it for the most part and just, you know, focusing on making it the best experience you can, not just for you, um, but for each and every person involved in it especially you know the teachers and the students so i appreciate that about you quite a bit yeah the commitment well-being so, of all involved and the and the each person getting the best out of the experience exactly yeah i don't think i want to be manu manu manipulative and then hurt people and hurt myself and hurt god and hurt church you know hurt the world mm. The, the goal in my life right now is to be able to be vulnerable to my own family, especially mm -hmm. when my daughter and wife looks and in, looks into my heart and open mm -hmm. the curtain and see the secrets in my life. And they say, wow, I want to celebrate what's going on in, in his inner life. Mm -hmm. So that's my personal goal. When I, when I stand before God, when I stand before my family, can they mm -hmm. see purity? Can they see integrity? Can they see um, pure mm -hmm. motive? Um, heavenly vision, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. I think that elevates me <laughs> above all the garbage and junk in this world. So, I think that's that's what keeps me going. And yeah, I'm 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 having a joint class with William, and you're welcome to join us <laughs> after the coaching. <laughs> well, that's an admirable goal. That's an admirable goal. So, yeah, to have that kind of pure heart that no matter what, you can stand before God or for your family. And yeah, be be at peace. Uh -huh. So yeah, and you said what a joint class? You know, after the coaching, uh, uh, Will and I are coaching teaching these days. And then when the time comes for him to sing, he he takes his kids to his classroom. Mm. So you can maybe try that out, maybe after the coaching, what? thirty minutes. What? So you guys do that um at four thirty. Yeah, four to four thirty. Uh, four thirty to five. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, you have in class at that point. In time. So you mean bring my students to that thing? No, they're already there. They're already mm -hmm. there. Oh, so you guys are co-teaching during the coaching class. So coaching four to four thirty, mm -hmm. and then four thirty to five. William and I are in the same space in the coaching room. We're having mm -hmm. a joint class, and we are having mm -hmm. students interact with each other and after and after that he takes his kids to his classroom interesting ah so my kids could join my students could join from yeah, because because they, they're already there mm. and yeah you can you can try that and then it'll be interesting to see what you guys are doing at the time yeah <laughs> the one thing i would i would i think another thing that would be lovely is if we like got together and kind of exchanged learning facilitation ideas and and um, sure, sure. you know, uh, game ideas, classroom management ideas. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, let's let's do that. I think we can do that during the meeting more, and maybe we can daily talk about what we're gonna do for games, what worked well. <clears throat> I'm trying to do it at six, um, so I can check on teachers and stuff, because mm -hmm. I realize six to six thirty is not really just. 
I don't know, just to time to chill, but also time to see what's going on. I, because I, I, I see more and more that it's very important to connect with teachers, mm. also with parents and kids. So I'm trying to be more better informed. Um, so mm. I'm trying to make myself more accessible. Okay. Yeah, so Makes sense. I guess we can try. It's a good strategy, a good strategy. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on your time on Sunday. And I hope you hope you had a great time and then have a great evening tonight. Well, it was definitely interesting. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm not sure if it went exactly as <laughs> anticipated. It, it, it did. It did happen exactly I want, the way I wanted. <laughs> but I'm glad that I was able to contribute to the YouTube channel slash podcast. <laughs> And hopefully people will be blessed and um, um, yeah, get something out of this lovely experience that we're sharing with them. Thank you so much. I'll see you Thank on Tuesday. You see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.